Is it working? Yeah. All right, well, good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, session with uh, Grant Underwood uh, as part of our seminar on B.H. Roberts. Uh, most of you know me. My name is Brian Birch. Uh, teach uh, philosophy and religious studies here at UVU and uh, am one of the uh, co-conspirators and collaborators in SMPT. And uh, as I've said many times before, it's uh, one of my greatest pleasures to uh, work with some of the people I've worked with on this society. And, and uh, over the years, we've been a small and fledgling group, but we've done some very good work and, and we're excited about what's happening today. I apologize for not being able to be here this morning or, or this afternoon. After this event was scheduled, my boss decided to uh, uh, pencil in a retreat for all of the uh, administrative leadership on campus, and uh, so I'm running back and forth. But I wanted to make sure that I was here to introduce my very good friend and colleague and collaborator, uh, Grant Underwood, uh, known to most of us. Uh, Dr. Underwood is a professor of history at BYU. Uh, worked for several years in the Joseph uh, Fielding Smith Institute, the Latter-day Saint history <laughs> and scholarship. What's the thing? They hoped there was scholarship attached, but they didn't dare stick it in the title. <laughs> uh, is, uh, is a very well-respected, well-known historian uh, in Mormon study circles. Uh, he was the organizing force behind the Mormon Studies consultation at the American Academy of Religion, along with uh, Jim McLaughlin. Uh, I had the pleasure of serving on that committee for a few years, uh, but it's just delightful to work with him. Uh, some of you know that Grant and I are, are currently working on a book, uh, tentatively entitled Mormonism and Christian Thought, uh, due out sometime next year, but I've been saying that for three or four years. So. <laughs> I think I'm the Phil Barlow of Mormon theology. <laughs> uh, good shout out to Phil. Uh, so without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dr. Grant Underwood. Good morning. I'm not sure if the mic's on or off. Let's see here. What are we doing? It's on. It's on? Yeah, it's working. Sounds uh, no different than without. Uh, <clears throat> my uh, objective this morning is to uh, move us a bit from the rarefied levels that Professor Robson had us in and uh, kind of give a little bit of an overview to the uh, third book in B.H. Roberts's uh, 70s uh, course um, and highlight I sent out some uh, selected some readings but uh, I know how life is, and probably most of us haven't had a chance to engage those, so I'll, I'll hit some of the highlights of my highlights for a while. And then I'm very interested in getting your reactions. A few of you may have read and want to discuss some aspects of his um, argumentation and uh, evidence and the way he frames his discussion. Um, I'm interested in what you might have to say, so we'll uh, move into the discussion after 20 minutes or so of a bit of an overview here. If you, if you look at your, I gave you a little um, table of contents here. Um, let me just say before we begin, I'm not sure if Kent uh, talked about this, but I think Anyone who's looked at this is amazed at what uh, a group of humble, ordinary folks in um, a kind of rural, agrarian area out in the middle of the, the Great Basin decided to do. Uh, B.H. Roberts definitely did not uh, have a condescending attitude. He respected his colleagues. Um, he wanted to help educate them and he felt that from everything one can read, he felt that an educated representative of the church was uh, better than one who was under-informed. 
uh, that you had to know what you were talking about and what you were likely to encounter in order to be effective. Um, a couple of comments then on that. Um, in the opening portion, he lists for three pages what he calls books of reference that he feels, just imagine this, you're a, uh, a farmer, hard-working farmer, 70, in um, Payson, and you uh, come to gather with your 70 quorum, and the objective is to engage information and a, a past that otherwise would be entirely unfamiliar. And he suggests that the 70s maintain a library or individual 70s acquire all of these works. And they range, of course, from Bible dictionaries to studies of Christian doctrine to works you would recognize. Um, Andrew Dixon White's famous Warfare of Science and Theology was very significant in the late 19th century. A lot of this, of course, uh, seems dated to us, but was contemporary at the time. Max Muller, the great, uh, one of the great pioneers in the comparative study of religion, um, he has his important work here listed, um, and so it continues, um, including a number of Roberts' own works. And the idea was that the men in the 70s Quorum were to take each of these lessons and what Roberts provides, the, the bulk of this 220-page book is made up of excerpts, largely excerpts from a number of these readings that he fears some of his colleagues may not have access to or that he wants to highlight. And so he includes those in what he calls notes. Now at the beginning of each, uh, at the beginning of each lesson, he kind of gives an outline, uh, and this is kind of what it looks like here. So these are the main points, and then in a tiny little column to the right, he indicates the particular reference works from his initial bibliography that he suggests the 70 study in order to develop these particular points. What follows is not really a, a lesson plan, but simply some excerpts or notes that would be supplementary and assist them in developing these particular points using the reference works that he suggested and particularly the readily available notes. That's what each lesson consists of. Now, if you look at this little sheet I gave you here, this is a kind of a, a big picture look at the book. There are three parts to this volume. The first one, notice, is the sources of man's knowledge of God. And then he develops that through ten lessons. As you can see, 43 pages of it, of the 220 page book, is devoted to kind of setting the stage. Where do human beings get any kind of knowledge of God? Where do they think this comes from? And he gives four areas. Tradition, and then you can see how he breaks that down. Uh, creation, and here the argument is, it's the traditional Christian argument that had been around for centuries, that in the created world, in the created universe, one sees evidence of God. The next, uh, various different arguments, the soul's innate consciousness, the first cause, uh, he touches lightly on those, and then he finishes up with revelation as the source of God's knowledge. And he comes through uh, various texts, and um, one of the interesting little side points is if you look down at under revelation, point number five and six. Uh, I find this interesting that he, he's very careful. He wants his colleagues to 
not just kind of make broad generalizations that everything a church leader has ever said is revelation. He, he makes a distinction even for Joseph Smith between the canonized revelations and the what he would consider the uncanonized revelations of lectures on faith and the first vision. Um, from there he moves into a discussion on the limitations of revelation which you can see out, outlined there and what he's particularly talking about in this point is uh, essentially what you get in the end of Moses chapter 1 um, basically revelations in our canon pertain to this world but there are many other worlds and he likes to make that point and says that we don't necessarily know everything about all of God's works we know primarily what pertains to our earth and heavens then he moves into part two, which represents about half of the book, as you can see here, Conceptions of God. And he wants his uh, 70 uh, associates there to know about the differing ideas of God that have uh, been promulgated over the centuries. And you can see he goes way back and he touches on and gives little excerpts on everything uh, from Mesopotamia down in four, Egyptians five, Phoenicians, Persians, Greeks and Romans, lingers there for a couple of lessons, moves into the religions of Northern Europe, back down to uh, the subcontinent, touching on Hinduism and Buddhism, beliefs in China, beliefs of uh, the Mohammedans, of the Muslims. So he gives all that background and that's for a number of lessons. I imagine these wonderful farmer 70s getting together to probably have their first discussion on Buddhism or um, some of these other topics here. Look next at the uh, B, patristic doctrines of God. Here he's zeroing in, of course, because that's going to be the foil for what in the end of his book is the true doctrine of God. So he elaborates basically to uh, make sure that the men understand uh, different aspects of what the church fathers and that's the origin, as we all know, of the term uh, patristic there. What they were uh, teaching and believing. If you look down that list, you see they touch on many of the, the main issues. He comes down with a bit of a, a historical sweep for the first half a dozen or so. And then he plunges into the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, that, as that begins to emerge, uh, particularly in the second century, he'll pick up early and take it right down through the fourth. Uh, then he's off on the creeds, uh, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Creed of Saint, Saint Athanasius. And he understands that um, he's very well read, and that's just a side comment I would offer, that he's uh, extremely well educated for someone who didn't go to and have the opportunity to advance study in a school setting. Um, he moves from there into some of the, the Arian controversy, the metaphysical issues involved there, and kind of finishes there. His next section takes us into medieval. Notice how he spells, we don't spell medieval that way anymore, but that was good kind of Victorian spelling. Uh, he takes, imagine taking these Farmer 70 into Anselm and Aquinas. Uh, all of you, of course, love these uh, philosophers and scholars. Um, and then down into modern conceptions. And he spends uh, a section, several sections on uh, philosophy here. And look what he introduces them to. How many Latter-day Saints today, even well-educated Latter-day Saints, find themselves in church discussing idealism, empiricism, Spinoza, Berkeley, Kant, Schleiermacher, 
it goes on. Very impressive that we have a whole lesson on that with these folks. Then he gets to section three, and this is really the nub. He's just teeing himself up now to bat the ball and, and argue with all these uh, basically uninspired conceptions. Um, he's not as denigrating of these as you might assume, except occasionally he gets a few jabs in. But he wants to set forth the true doctrine of God. And so he goes about it, and we're going to zero in now on this third section. And I, that's kind of where I culled some, some uh, readings from for all of us. Um, lesson 32, if you look at the A and there's a 32 by it, at this point I'm tracking lessons just so that you can know how he set this up. The first one is just a review of the entire part one, just to freshen everybody up. And then he wants to come in to uh, his point that the world needs a revelation of God. That the best and really ultimately the only way to know God is through revelation. And what's interesting here and what's different than many Latter-day Saints might expect is that he's not quite so interested in arraying all the LDS canonical texts that might be utilized. He, he employs them selectively. His point, because he's in a mode of discussing with Christians who don't necessarily embrace these texts, and so they have to be used sparingly. Instead, his main argument is going to be that the greatest and clearest and best revelation of God is the person of Jesus Christ. So let, let's just take a look. Let me at this point kind of read just a snippet uh, from this particular lesson 33. He says, and lo, when the veil falls from the revelation that God gives of himself, what form is that which steps forth from the background of the world's ignorance and mystery? A man, as God lives, Jesus of Nazareth, the great peasant teacher of Judea, he is God revealed henceforth to the world. Just an interesting question for us. I don't know what your experience is, or even if most of you are Latter-day Saint. If you have experience in Latter-day Saint circles or congregations, I, I would ask you, how often is that thought expressed in ordinary LDS circles? God is revealed <clears throat> henceforth to the world through Jesus Christ. They who thought God impersonal, without form, must know him henceforth as a person in the form of the man. They who have held him to be without quality, and here he's reflecting back on some of the uh, discussion of infinitude and connecting with the, uh, what he finds troubling in the uh, description of God coming out of the, uh, the, the earlier centuries, they who thought God without quality must henceforth know him as possessed of the qualities of Jesus of Nazareth. They who have regarded him as infinitely terrible must know him as infinitely gentle, etc., etc. This is the God manifest in the flesh. This is the Son of God who comes to reveal the Father. And then he zeroes in a bit more on this, and I'll read this little snippet here. Mark, in all of this, there is not a word about the mysterious, ineffable generation of the Son of God from the Father, together with all the mysteries that men have gathered together in their learned disquisitions about God. No question is raised as to whether Jesus was made out of nothing or begotten by ineffable generation from the substance of the Father. I think you hear the echoes of the conversation in the fourth century. This is a guy who's connected. Whether he is consubstantial, 
homoousion, that is, of the same substance with the Father, or of a similar substance, homoousio. Nor is there any question raised as to whether Jesus was begotten before or after time began. C can you hear in this five sentences major issues out of the fourth century search for a Christian doctrine of God? All these and a hundred other questions arose after the Christian doctrine of deity began to come in contact with the Greek and other philosophies. Jesus accepted the existence of God as a settled fact and proclaimed himself to be the Son of God. And so he goes on and basically summarizes the point that uh, is made here in this whole section. And he's going to use that to argue for everything from the physical corporeality of God, the fleshly corporeality of God. His main argument for that is that that's how Jesus Christ was. That Jesus Christ, when he received the fullness of deity, was a resurrected, glorified being of flesh and bone. And he then argues from there to say, therefore, if Jesus Christ is God's self-revelation, then that glorified corporeality is who God is, the Father. Now that's quite an argument. I don't hear that a lot in ordinary uh, church circles today. We attempt to make that case in other ways, but that's, that was his argument here at great length in the book. Now, then he goes on, look at uh, um, lesson 34 here, the character of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Um, and so, Let's see where I want to be here with this. Um, this is kind of what that looks like. He's basically trying to say again, using Jesus Christ as the best revelation. He could quote many scriptures out of the Bible or out of modern revelation that might make that point, but he doesn't. He chooses to say, Jesus was compassionate. Jesus was impartial. Just go down your, your list here. Jesus was tolerant. Jesus was loving. Jesus was both just and severe. Each point made in this um, lesson on the character of God, he makes via discussion of how Jesus' character was and therefore that's how God the Father is. So he's really pushing that. He's got an interesting angle that, um, again, is not all that common. Because typically folks establish these characteristics by quoting different scriptures that illustrate, well, this is how God is, or this is how God is not. But his, he's got a consistency here to his approach, which is, that I'm going to use Jesus Christ as the mere image of the Father. In fact, he loves that passage in Hebrews and sees more in it simply than physical image. That God, or that Christ, is in every way the express image of God. And that everything that is God, and he quotes Colossians, that the fullness of God dwells in Christ. And therefore, we can know everything about God via Jesus Christ. Okay, then we're down to um, the um, lesson 35, the Godhead. And at this point, um, let, let me just kind of summarize, actually, I have a little quote here I'd like to share with you. Um, to summarize this point that we've been making, <clears throat> um, notice uh, this, this fleshly corporeality. This is kind of his 
powerful statement on this. He says, I deplore those sectarian refinements which try to tell us about the humanity of Jesus being separate from the divinity of Jesus. He himself made no such distinctions. He was divine, spirit and body, and spirit and body was exalted to the throne of his Father and sits there now with all the powers of the Godhead residing in him bodily, an immortal, glorified, exalted man, the express image and likeness of God the Father. For as the Son is, so also is the Father. Yet, when Latter-day Saints announce to the world that we believe God to be an exalted man, we are told that we are blasphemers. But as long as the throne of Jesus Christ stands secure, so long as his spirit remains in his immortal body of flesh and bones, glorified and everlasting, shall keep his place by the side of the Father, so long will the doctrine that God is an exalted man hold its place against the idle sophistries of the learned world. Uh, you may know that there were folks in the fourth century who really wrestled with this idea of what happened to Jesus' body after the resurrection. One of the most famous is Marcellus of Ankara in Turkey, who uh, develops an elaborate theory which is essentially rejected by most of the church fathers that at some point the body would dissolve and the sun would be reabsorbed uh, into the essence uh, of the father. Uh, that wasn't common and wasn't widely accepted. So on to lesson 35, the Godhead. Let's see what we have here. Um, one of the points that he wants to make is, uh, as you can see here, uh, he first kind of reviews uh, the nature of each, then he engages in number four, the Trinity, as specifying that they're equal, and then he goes into this plurality of divine intelligences, because he's going to use the plurality of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, if you can have three perfect divine intelligences, then you can have more. And that sets the stage for the possibility of eternal progression of humanity into that uh, college or divine collegiality. Uh, he sets this up with a number of interesting quotes text that you would recognize, of course, he goes to the 82nd Psalm. Um, he quotes, um, he's going to quote, um, the, the quote or misquote, we might say, uh, 1 Corinthians 8. He's even going to dredge up a little text out of Orson Pratt in the Journal of Discourses where he references a, a revelation which now we realize was recorded as a revelation. Some of you may be aware that the Book of Commandments and Revelations, the manuscript kind of behind the published Book of Commandments, is, has come to light in the last handful of years and has been published as part of the Joseph Smith Papers. And in there, this revelation, he talks about um, Amon and the sons Amon and that they're all parts of God, etc., etc. This was alluded to, we had no knowledge of this prior to a few years ago, except through Orson Pratt. Now you can read the actual text himself, uh, text itself. Basically, he then concludes and says, the matter is clear, men and gods are of the same race. Jesus is the Son of God, and so too are all men the offspring of God. Jesus, but the firstborn of many brethren, they're quoting a passage out of Romans. Eternal intelligences have this equal dignity. Now, here's a, a quote I'd be interested in having you all respond to. I don't know if you read this one, but this is uh, one of the most expansive visions that I know of uh, for how it is that you have this plurality of gods. Just This is a long quote, so just kind of Try to s listen to this and absorb the way he puts this together. You'll recognize that 
he's building on, in a sense, one of his mentors is Orson Pratt. You know that Orson Pratt and Brigham Young had this teate through the 50s and 60s about the nature, what, what makes God, God, right? And that Orson Pratt came down on the what makes God, God, really are the attributes and characteristics. It's not the being, it's not a, a, a particular being named Elohim or a particular being named Jehovah. It's not intrinsic to their own personality. It's something that they have taken on or acquired this, this uh, package of divine characteristics and attributes that make them God. And in the same way, it can make Jim and Kent and anybody else God at some future point. Well, they go back and forth on this, and, and that's probably some of the background to where Roberts is coming from. But notice how Roberts does this here. Uh, let me read you this excerpt. He says, It is possible for the mind of God to be in man, to will and to do, as seemeth God good. The nature of the whole clings to the parts, and they may carry with them the parts the light and the truth and the glory of the whole. Moreover, by appointment, any one of the three, now in the Godhead, and he's choosing to call them divine intelligences here at this point, capitalized, any one of the three of these intelligences may become the embodiment and representative of all the power and glory and authority of the sum total of the three in which capacity either the one or the three would no longer stand in their own individual character as gods, but they would stand as the sign and symbol of all that is divine, and would act as and be to all intents and purposes the one God. That's an interesting discussion, isn't it, of the oneness. And not in, many, in ways, not dramatically different than fourth century notions, um, given the philosophical background that uh, God, you understand the, the, the nature of how the spirit is everywhere in its wholeness. It's, it's not that when the spirit, God as spirit, or God fills the immensity, it's the argument of immensity, right? That you have, you can, you fill every inch, as it were, of space but every bit of divinity is in every inch of space. And that, that was a common notion. And, and he's essentially saying something similar, that the fullness of divinity is there uh, with one or three. And so in every inhabited world, now he then takes this further. And so in every inhabited world, and in every system of worlds, A, God presides. Deity in his own right and person, by virtue of the essence of him, and by virtue of his being the sign and symbol of the collectivity of the divine intelligences of the universe. Interesting phrase. Having access to all the councils of the gods, each individual deity may become a partaker of the collective knowledge, wisdom, honor, power, majesty, and glory of the body divine. In a word, the embodiment of the spirits of the gods whose influence permeates the universe. You can see some echoes, right, with what Orson Pratt was saying here. And then he comes on and really kind of gets his point in the next paragraph. This doctrine of deity teaches a divine government for the world that is in harmony with our knowledge of the universe. An infinitude of worlds and systems of worlds rising one above another in ever-increasing splendor in limitless space and eternal duration have as a concomitant an endless line of exalted divine men to preside over and within them as priests, kings, patriarchs, gods. Nor is there confusion, disorder, and strife in their vast dominions, for they all govern upon the same righteous principles that characterize the government of God everywhere, 
These divine intelligences have attained unto the excellence that Jesus prayed for in behalf of his apostles. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. I say, divine intelligences have attained unto the excellence of oneness that Jesus prayed his disciples might possess. And since they have attained unto it, and all govern their worlds and systems of worlds by the same spirit, by the same principles, there is unity in their government that makes it one even as they are one. Let worlds and systems of worlds, galaxies of systems and universes extend as they may through limitless space. Joseph Smith has revealed the existence of a divine government which characterized by unity is coextensive with all these worlds and world systems. That's quite a fascinating and rich vision, isn't it? For how he envisions, uh, what, what will this be like? Uh, what he envisions a kind of eternal progression uh, to entail. Um, Okay, well, our time is zooming on. Let me just see what else we can summarize before we get into discussions here. Um, in the next chapter 36, we've just got these last two here. Chapter 36, he wants to talk about, um, he engages the objections um, that God is a spirit, not with a body, that God is invisible. And then, of course, the uh, anthropomorphism, he takes that on. Um, you can understand that. He finds a wonderful uh, quote from a Henry Mansell, who was an Anglican uh, in the late 19th century, in which he attributes this quote to him, calls it the morbid terror of anthropomorphism. You see that as point number seven. Um, maybe we feel that terror, maybe we know people who feel a morbid terror of anthropomorphism. He doesn't like, his, his interlocutor is um, uh, a minister from Pocatello, Idaho, uh, a priest, thank you, a priest, Catholic priest from Pocatello, Idaho, Vanderdonk, who, um, of course, uh, is a standard offers the standard kinds of expressions on these v matters, including the fact that um, anthropomorphic representations are essentially designed to communicate with uh, fallible mortal creatures who can't comprehend very well, and therefore you, you kind of have to present yourself. Um, and I think we understand that um, kind of like an avatar is today. We know how that's used both uh, in terms of the internet and in terms of movies, that that's not really who God is, that that's not inherently intrinsically like God, but that God essentially um, takes that form or projects that form or projects its being into that form so that uh, uh, folks can comprehend. And we understand that because how many sci-fi movies end up doing the same thing? You know, the alien has to take the human form to be able to interact with the human race. But that's really not, at some point in the movie, everybody realizes that that's really not what the alien looks like or is like. That's just the form they've acquired to be able to interact. And I, that's quite close to what was envisioned. Uh, Origen kind of uh, began this with his theory, what he called accommodation. And his kind of accommodationist perspective carries over into the next century and is widely used and then from then on in Christianity and was just de rigueur when Vanderdonk voices that, but it's frustrating to, um, to Roberts because he wants to take all of those anthropomorphic 
theophanies in the Bible literally. And there's where you see the kind of the twain not meeting. And it's because of the different hermeneutics, the different interpretive presuppositions. That, um, and Roberts just can't believe. And there you see, I think, a very distinctive approach. And that is this kind of Mormon face value literalism. Uh, and our tendency to take things that way comes out. Uh, but he does manage to find a few other folks who agree with him on this um, and who are uh, not as down on anthropomorphism uh, as might be expected. And then finally in chapter 37, um, He's going to take on some of the other ideas. Uh, he pursues his notion of the possibility of intelligences arriving at a perfect agreement so as to act in absolute unity. We kind of got a hint of that. He says here, in other words, oneness can be the result of perfect agreement among many intelligences as surely as it can be the result of the existence of only one intelligence. Um, then he goes off on ways that I think have become familiar to many Latter-day Saints. He wants to take the word Elohim in number five um, and make a point that's challenging to make um, given the ambiguity and multiply used term that Elohim uh, the way he, he's building off on Joseph Smith here, but I think some of us are aware that linguistically that's uh, uh, a bit complicated to just confine it to that. Um, then he talks about um, the oneness not being physical and his best, I'm down on point eight here, um, his best argument is uh, John 17. Probably some uh, in this room served an LDS mission and uh, have used John 17 in exactly the same way that he uses it. Um, that that's a kind of oneness in a great many other ways, but not physically. Now. Let me just take a couple more minutes on the, um, I didn't give you the full outline for book four because it's um, his book on the atonement, but he starts out with some matter on intelligences, which it would be good for us just to kind of finish up with. Uh, his lesson is the eternity of intelligences, and this is where B.H. Roberts really sets out his notion that the way he takes the famous passage in section 93, that man was in the beginning with God, um, intelligence was not created, cannot be created. Um, that's what it's referring to, that kind of uncreated, the doctrine, what he calls the doctrine of the co-eternity of all intelligences. Um, now some, of course, know that there's been a bit of a discussion about what is that kind of primordial, way back then, intelligence referring to. Is it some kind of mass entity or individual intelligences? This is how he comes down on that. He says this, so far as human or revealed knowledge can aid one in forming a conclusion, there is no intelligence existing separate and apart from persons, from intelligent entities, from individuals. Um, and so he argues that there have always existed, that the, the eternal nature of intelligence is really best understood as the eternal nature of separate and distinct entities individual intelligences. And he pursues that for a while. And then he makes his point. 
He says here, he differentiates spirits and intelligences. Spirits are uncreated intelligences inhabiting spiritual bodies, while intelligences, pure and simple, are intelligent entities, but unembodied in either spirit bodies or bodies of flesh and bone. They are uncreated, self-existent entities. But let it be observed in passing that nothing is known as to the form of these intelligent entities, nor as to the mode of their existence. And so we have, uh, he goes through the typical discussion here of how all were given spirit bodies, all uh, that the son, as well as all the other sons and daughters, were given spirit bodies uh, to house their self-existing, pre-existing, individual intelligence. And that makes us all family, and uh, Jesus is the elder brother, and um, I think that's a good place to pause here and then just say that his, his interests primarily are, one, to establish that Jesus is the great revealer of what we need to know about God, two, that um, this kind of literal approach to the scriptures causes him to um, kind of miss some of the patristic distinction between person, as the term came to be defined in the Greek term hypostasis, that there are three hypostases in one usia, or usia, um, and these three individual entities, these three distinctive realities within one essence, he hears the word person because this gets translated into person, and person comes across to him as a separate being, and because Latter-day Saints believe that the three are separate beings, he tends to miss some of the subtlety about which decades of discussion uh, occurred in the fourth century over how do you, how do you identify the threeness of God as along with the oneness of God. What, what, what is the nature of that threeness? What is the nature of those hypostases? So he tends to take things more literally, separate beings, physical God, um, and then finally moves into a discussion of this, at the core of his theology is this notion growing out of section 93 and the King Follett discourse that there's this whole array of self-existing intelligences that eventually God comes along and helps them in their progression by giving them spirit bodies and eventually after they get their mortal bodies and are resurrected and continue in the path of the greatest intelligence of all, they will acquire to that level of perfection and divinity through which all the divine intelligences that operate as gods around the cosmos have achieved and then we'll be in the, uh, rather than the College of Cardinals, you'll be in the College of Gods, and all will be well and the cycle will continue. So, there you have it. Um, now, what, uh, what catches your fancy about Roberts here? What did you, what shall we uh, chat about here a little bit? Just, just to remind everyone before you ask the question, you use the microphone, and this is a discussion, obviously, I'm, I don't have all the answers uh, of, of anything, so uh, just offer your two cents, uh, particularly as you've engaged this material yourself. Jim? Okay, uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, the long quote you read there on page 198, 199. Yes, sir. It, it just hit me, you said Avatar. Uh, that how uh, uh, 
I wonder if James Cameron was influenced by B.H. Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> good, you good. There's a strange thing in there where the, um, the avatar is more real than the place that he comes from. Yeah, so interesting. Want, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's dances with wolves, I guess, done in outer space where you know, Kevin Costner becomes, Lakota becomes more real than he does in the white guy. But, yeah, uh, um, yeah. but there is that, that, that kind of sense there. And in, in, in this uh, passage here, um, I was wondering, uh, you, you were saying how uh, it sounds sort of like uh, what happens in the fourth century. But I think there's an important distinction uh, you know, where he's talking about everybody kind of tying into the oneness. Mm -hmm. uh, it, in, in Roberts, it doesn't seem to be the case as it is with, well, there, there's two distinctions here. One, that's only going to be the Godhead that, that does that for right, the, right. The, 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 the church fathers. And two, uh, they're in eternity, uh, not in time. Right. And the time is the pale shadow of eternity. Whereas here, it seems the time is, you know, this is all in us. Yeah. That's a good point, Jim. I, I think that the distinction between eternity, the kind of ontological distinction between eternity and time is just not something Latter-day Saints, uh, uh, until all of you came along, you know, grappled with. You know, it was not that comprehension of eternity as being other than unending time. Uh, that is categorically different. Um, I, you're right, that's not something that they engage. And, um, and what that means about the nature of an eternal essence or being, or how, how can three hypostases in eternity function uh, as part of a single essence? That's not something he's engaging here. Yeah, well, and two, I think that he sort of does in, in the Vanderdoff discussion, but with the sense, and maybe he doesn't ever explicitly get at it, but somehow time is better than any kind of idea of eternity like that. Because time is where you know, love happens, where the body, where you know, all this kind of richness happens, where is eternity, you know, kind of the pale shadow. You know, the pale shadow becomes what used to be the ideal. Uh, the other thing, uh, uh, how much of this, uh, just a, 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 a kind of a, a technical question, uh, how much of this section is just Mormon doctrine of deity lifted and put into uh, It's a years? good question. I, uh, you know, we don't have time to go into all of it, but in the process of preparing this, I went through and marked my copy of the Mormon Doctrine of Deity uh, with um, matched up the excerpts, uh, large portions of it. It's, it's uh, you know, he's, uh, and of course Mormon Doctrine of Deity is a replay of some things he wrote for the Improvement Era and a couple of other speeches. Um, it may, might be interesting to say how much of this is kind of fresh, new, kind of further thinking on the part of, of Roberts beyond Mormon doctrine and hardly any. So it, it's, it's just largely, and that's, that's in the spirit of what he said he was going to do. He was excerpting from these different books in the bibliography and he includes, he, includes, uh, he, he, he doesn't do false humility here, uh, he includes Mormon doctrine in one of his, in his bibliography, but in case the folks don't have it, he makes it readily available to them, which is great. It's fair. Well, it's interesting in a way, though, too, that uh, but Conkey does the same thing. He's, he goes back and quotes himself quite often, and uh, so there's, there's a trend here. Yeah. When you're an expert, you're an expert. What can we say? <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's just kind of a, evolves that way. Uh, may, maybe I'm not quite right, but I've noticed that what he is doing is uh, in my manuals from the 1890s on up, that he paralleled that order 
in his book, uh, The Truth, Way, and the Lie. Uh, it, the uh, chapter sequences are pretty much the same. So he spent 50 years mulling over the truth, way, and the lie, mm -hmm. developing it uh, on through there. Okay? When uh, Joseph Elon Smith came into the MIA in 1906 or whatever, he split off and then did his uh, five uh, uh, priests and manuals of church semi course of theology. Those two still didn't get along, even, <laughs> even then. I think it would be, uh, that, that's a good comment. Uh, I would just, however, <laughs> add, it may, uh, I wouldn't uh, take exception to the fact that they come from different places and see things differently. But just in point of fact, historical fact, Roberts continues to write for the Improvement Era after 1906, after, and I don't recall the exact year, I assume you're dead on with that year, but, but, but afterwards he, he's, he's writing in through the teens, he, he makes uh, full, takes full advantage of that. I think what's interesting is that the Mutual Improvement Association back then was um, more of a, an adult experience than just a little, you know, uh, 14 and 15 year old boys. Obviously we're just kind of moving more and more into uh, uh, young boy Aaronic priesthood ordinations. Th this is in a process of being finalized. We didn't we didn't get specification of ages uh, until the early 1900s in that, so we're still moving into that phase. And so a lot of the Mutual Improvement Association is it's uh, young adults. It's a kind of a young adult uh, growth experience, and, and they have some pretty heavy stuff and some great thoughtful material in the Improvement Era. Other comments, questions? Yeah. Hi, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you for bringing up Doctrine and Covenants section 93. I've been um, struggling with something that's brought up the same day in 94 and later on in 97, and that is when they're building the campus, the temple campus for the stake of Zion, mm -hmm, and there mm -hmm. are these various outbuildings. Mm -hmm. And the Lord says in the Revelation, you know, keep yourselves clean, keep the building clean. My glory will be there, my presence will be there, but if not, my glory will not be there, and my presence will not be there. And I've been struggling with what exactly that presence is. We know that it's, he didn't say my Holy Spirit or my spirit will be there, so it's not that guy. He didn't, and I don't think that we understand the presence of the Lord in that way as his corporealness being there, standing on his own two feet. How would, if you can channel Brother Roberts or if you can help me solve this problem, how can you talk to me about that particular use of that word in that way? That's a good question. Um, I think you've identified um, two ways that you discount that probably most Latter-day Saints would assume is the answer. Uh, the, the dominant one being that that presence is simply a, a synonym for his spirit. Um, the other kind of manifestation that I can't quite wrap my brain around. Yeah, and maybe it is. Maybe it is. I mean, I, I, my answer is I don't know what that's, that revelation or that, that usage precisely means. Uh, I, I think we, the best we can do is say what's been the range of thought among Latter-day Saints, and I, I think you're not satisfied, uh, apparently, with the typical answers, and nor should you be particularly. It's great to quest for further insight. But I think most people have been satisfied with the, taking that metaphorically for, you know, God's spirit will be there and... Uh, the representation, as you were talking about, if the Holy Ghost became a representative for all three and his, he exerted himself through every inch, as you said, of the building, that, that would satisfy most people. That's a nice application of that idea. I think that's w well thought through probably most wouldn't think it through quite that deeply. Uh, I, I think the other point you made, I just want to comment on that, and, and that is I, there's a, a kind of another tradition about the presence of God in temples, which I think we're all familiar with, right? It's the, you know, Lorenzo Snow walking down the hall and... Right, he's going through the files. Or, or, or whatever, you know, encounters, you know, that we, we, these stories that circulate 
about actual personal handshaking encounters with the Almighty within the confines of the temple. You, you, have, that tra you have that interpretive tradition that I, I think also coexists. Uh, I don't, those who voice that I don't think are trying to say that exclusively defines what his presence means or to limit the interpretation of that idea just to a physical encounter. But I think they like to throw that in. And, uh, and generally, though, it's more in this other realm. Now, if you're in your quest to uh, think through something more there, um, I'd be interested to, you know, if you come to something that, yeah, that's... Yeah, the delta waves hit me tomorrow in the shower. I will great. text you immediately. Good, good. You can do a presentation. <laughs> From the shower. Uh, I think Kent's here waiting, and then Charlie. Um, I was pleased that you uh, talked about the uh, passage where uh, he, he argues that there is no one great intelligence. There are individuals who are intelligent. And uh, uh, I, I, uh, I agree with Roberts, and, uh, and I agree that, uh, that that's what's in the the Joseph Smith English version of the uh, Doctrine and Covenants and the, and the Pearl Great Price and so on. And, uh, uh, and one of the things that I've discovered is that uh, uh, that is not always accurately translated. And the, Interesting. The, the yeah. books now are translated into many languages, but uh, I discovered this uh, years and years ago. Uh, I, I was, uh, I think it was a German Bible I was reading and, uh, and discovered that uh, that whole idea that Roberts emphasized was not in, in the doctrine. What was in there was that there is intelligence and, and uh, it's, it's something individual. Uh, as something uh, important aside from individual intelligences. Uh, and uh, and I, th I think, fortunately, someone discovered that this was a mistranslation of what Joseph Smith had put in and what Roberts was reporting on and, uh, and was corrected eventually. So the, 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 the Bible was corrected to indicate that this concept uh, Interesting. Was, was uh, accurate. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm uh, interested in is have, have we gotten it accurate in all of the Bibles, that, in, in all of the translations of uh, the Books of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price? Have, have we gotten it accurate in all of them? And I can't tell you. I, I don't know. But I've looked at a number of different languages and and, uh, and fortunately, it's been consistent with what Joseph Smith did. Jim, you want to build on that? Yeah, I'm going <clears> to... <throat> say a lot more about it. I'm going to say a lot more about it, and I'm going to argue that, in fact, it isn't. Uh, we don't know what, what Joseph Smith said, for sure, and that Robert's interpretation is one of several. True. Uh, that, and, and fairly late. Okay, so, so you're going to play history on this. I want to take you to the level of philosopher that you are. What's your personal feeling? Are you a collectivist or an individualist on this matter? And, and why does it matter one way or the other? Could you comment on that? Well, yeah, and uh, I don't want to shoot everything here. I mean, Go for it. Give us a teaser. <laughs> <laughs> well, personally, I'm, I, I very much think uh, in relation to individualism because I think uh, it takes care of certain problems of, of, of uh, evil, for example. But uh, it's, you know, as I said, I don't think it's a matter, of, it's, it's certainly not obviously a matter, a subtle matter of moral doctrine. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't think, uh, right, Roberts may have thought it was obvious and settled in his mind, but... Uh, 
as late as 2000, we have statements to the contrary. Uh, but what, what interests me is, uh, I think it's um, indisputable that there is that varied engagement with the term and with the notion of intelligence. What, what interests me is what drives people to argue one way or the other. I mean, what, what, what kind of notion or perception or conception of the universe or, na or being or essence or creation or whatever, trying to understand their presuppositions that lead them to favor one or the other, that, that's what interests me. Well, it has, uh, I mean, there on the one side, there is the problem of evil and, and where did it come from. On the other side, uh, it, it just seems to be an interest in trying to uh, safeguard the glory of God. And so... You know, it's very interesting. You hear what Jim just said. That, that is so... That is exactly what motivated a, a prime motivation of the Arians. Why did they want a, a kind of period uh, when the, uh, there was when he was not? Uh, why? It, it, it's to preserve the, the, the glory, the incomparability of God. And, and if you have, if you, in their view, if you have a co-uncreated being in the Son, a co-eternal something, hypostasis, in the sun, then you have put them on the same playing field. And they wanted to argue, and our point, my point, my interest is not to try to say what's right or wrong or settle the argument, but I, what I was interested in working through this, that that was a, a huge driving force for the Arians was to they, they felt that this notion of co-eternalism or co-eternal nature of the sun, the uncreated, if the sun was self-existing and uncreated, then that tarnished the distinctiveness, the uniqueness, the incomparability of God. And it's interesting that you would say that same, you would discern in your reading, that same kind of they thrust. Work with people, uh, and they were like, wrong, like Penrose and Lund, yeah. uh, that, uh, that, that, that same drawing. And th that's so interesting, where you, you, you get this, in a way, Roberts is coming from the other end of the spectrum, where he wants to celebrate that and extend that. Not only, not only are uh, and, and not just in the, in the fact that if you've got competing self-existing entities f forever or in eternity, that that somehow takes away from the one. But, but he wants to carry that into the, the, the future, the future eternity, and then line up not just those three, but every one of the other begotten ones that God has helped kind of move along to hit that same level and then participate in this, you know, extensive uh, kind of uh, unlimited um, array of gods and governances and in progressions in all kinds of cosmoses and so forth. And it's a... Uh, whether one uh, believes that or not, he, he seems to kind of lean into that and celebrate. Great, that was God's intent. God wasn't trying to preserve his incomparability, his place at the top of the pyramid. He wanted, and this seems in a way so 19th century, so democratic, the democratization of so many things that went on in the 19th century in America. It's a time of great leveling, uh, everybody gets a chance. Uh, those ideals weren't realized, of course, in actual history, but they were certainly given voice in so many ways. This, this kind of, why not? Why not have everybody be able to achieve that kind of uh, level status accomplishment? Um, so, uh, good. Well, 
I like to look to see how often a work gets reprinted to see what kind of staying power it has. Mm. This book, you know, the, the 70s course in theology, wasn't really reprinted until the later part of the 20th century. What, why no one paid attention to it for all those years? That's a good question, but, but be, beneath that, um, we, we have to dig a little beneath that question because um, this was designed for a particular subset of Latter-day Saints. This was designed specifically for, and when you read the thing, this isn't a general presentation for all the church members. We like to read it that way because we're just hungry for any, you know, any data or any document that can give us a clue as to what Mormons have thought. But, but this was written, I mean, it, it's like, you know, uh, um, I don't know, have you picked up, what's the name of this new Relief Society manual? Um, the, the, new, the new history that they just came out with? Daughters of My Kingdom. Daughters of my kingdom. Have, have you picked up and read Daughters of My Kingdom yet? I just kind of through it. Yeah. Well, and that's probably because you're an, an, a very curious individual. But, you know, most men that I associate with wouldn't think that necessarily applies to them. Um, and so the 70, this was for the 70. It was a lesson manual for the 70. And... Uh, and they're not yet into the mode that we come to in this day and age of recycling lesson manuals. Now, if you look at gospel principles, that's been recycled a half a dozen times. Or the, the, lesson, the gospel doctrine manuals have been through several iterations. Yeah. So, so, but that's not what they did. So when you do something that's a lesson manual, it was a kind of one-time only thing. So I think those are just elements of, that we ought to factor in and not say, well, it wasn't reprinted widely because that wasn't its intended audience it, or its intended use. It wasn't designed and written as a, a kind of primer for Latter-day Saints generally on these matters. Now, doctrine of uh, the, the Vanderdonk, the Mormon doctrine of deity thing, that gets reprinted a bit more. Because that was written, or he published that, to be uh, available to the general membership. So I wouldn't, in, in sum, I wouldn't deduce from the lack of republication that that meant that somebody was either displeased or uninterested or undervalued the 70s course in theology. It's interesting, though, that the very first one went through uh, one, one printing during his lifetime in 31, and then again in 44, some years after. So it indicates that people were thinking through uh, the course of theology, but they left two through five alone. <laughs> uh, and if there's another factor, it might be this is pretty dense stuff. Yeah. I mean, why wasn't... Uh, you know, why did, why was In Search of Lehi as a priesthood manual, you know, such, such a challenging text? I mean, it's not like we went through multiple years of doing In Search of Lehi. Um, you had to be a kind of Book of Mormon connoisseur to enjoy that kind of a thing. And as a general rule, too, the, the Taylor edition was printed uh, pretty much after the State quorums of 70s were dissolved and it became an organized basis in Salt Lake for the first quorum, the second quorum, the third quorum, the fourth quorum. So it's just a general observation that the two uh, correlated pretty much in time. I know we're out of time, but I've got to ask you this anyway, because you started out introducing this idea. Imagine uh, some guys down in Bluff, Utah, getting together at the uh, <laughs> 70s quorum talking about this. Uh, do we, you, as a, do you know anything about the reception, how deep this sunk with people, how, how, you know, at the time, how, how they dealt with it? No, I don't. It's a great question, if, you know, to... Uh someone really wanted to study that kind of 
reception history, if you will. That would be something I don't know about. I know from my father's generation, at least in my family, he was uh, a legend. Yeah. That's a good point. I think Mark, uh, Mark Olson was saying the same thing about one of his relatives. Mark, weren't you saying something to that effect about uh, the appreciation for Roberts on the part of your grandfather or yeah. somebody like that? Yeah. My grandfather, yeah. You know, uh, and then again one wonders if, you know, what is the nature of a hero? Uh, how many people in this day and age consider Hugh Nibley a hero? and you know would hold him up as one of the great lights of you know Mormonism but they've not really read him or don't pay much attention to him but you know everybody knows that Nibley's the man and and there was a sense probably that Roberts was the man I mean heaven knows he cranked the stuff out I mean he's a prolific author and particularly at this at this juncture in time you know he's coming he's got books several books on Joseph Smith, he's got, he's doing, uh, this is right at the time that he's, you know, done the history of the church, pulled all that together, what a massive work, you know, and he then goes on to, uh, to, to write these. I mean, this guy, who can, who can match him? Um, Fair. No, nobody wants to take anything away from James Talmadge. I, but I, I think the way Jim said it was uh, to his, was it your father or grandfather? My father and his brother. Yeah. Talmadge, Roberts, Widso, you know, that's the big, the Trinity. The turn of the century Trinity. <laughs> Quite time. Over time. Good. Now. So we, we're going to break for lunch. Oh, by the way, I did want to mention my grandfather did read the He wasn't just so, so but, um, That's a good high note to end on. Yeah. Someone who read Roberts. <laughs> um, probably the 30s, I would think. Uh, we need to break for lunch. Um, we, will re we will resume again at 2.15, where we'll hear a lot more about this question. Yeah, because I've got, the, I've got these guys in here to watch, so this stuff has to be lost. Yeah. You guys can watch their stuff. Well done. Thanks, Thanks Kevin. Thanks. Great to, great to have you here. Oh, thank you. I wish I would have been here for the early, and fortunately I would